Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon. I know a lot of other things are going on and it's Friday, um, but I think it is well worth coming out. Again, apologies to those who thought they were getting pizza and got sandwiches. That's my bad. Uh, I'm Wendy Carmet. I am on faculty here. Um, I'm also the faculty director of the Center for Social Policy and Law. Um, before we introduce our speaker, who I am so excited to hear, I just want to give, first of all, a shout out and thanks to the Center for Health Policy and Law's new managing director, Mary Buck. Uh, we're so thrilled that she has joined us. Come visit our center and Marine on the third floor of the library. And our many thanks to my uh, colleague in crime uh, and the, the second third of the torch chair, uh, Professor John Kahn. Um, so I also want to invite you to join our November. One of the things we do is we have frequent roundtables on November 17th at 12 45. Professor Jorge Contreras from the University of Utah will be presenting on genome defense and the civil rights case against Gene Patman. <clears throat> this roundtable is co-sponsored by Northeastern University Center for Law, Information, and Creativity. Click. And I want to ask you to keep your eyes out for our Great conference, very excited about this, April 14th. We do our conference every year on the Friday before Patriots Day. So it's kind of a holiday festive weekend here. Um, and this year, to celebrate and for the festivity, we have this uplifting focus called Viral and Misinformation. Very timely today with uh, Twitter's uh, change of Twitter. We can talk about who of us are getting on Twitter. Um, health impacts and legal solution. Um, and uh, if any of you have been watching the news during the pandemic, you know Dr. Peter Hurst, he will be our team. So we're very excited about that. And now I want to introduce my colleague, Sarah. I've already introduced her. So we'll introduce us to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I really am delighted and so pleased that we could have Sarah um, come and speak to us today. Uh, so Sarah Richardson is professor of the history of science and studies of women, gender, and sexuality at Harvard University. Um, she's an expert in the history and philosophy of the sciences of sex, gender, sexuality, and reproduction. And she also writes and teaches about race and science um, and feminist epistemology, philosophy of science, and social dimensions of science and knowledge. All these great sort of intersections of, of sciences and social sciences. Um, and um, besides her many scholarly articles um, published in an array of journals in, in history and social studies of science. Um, her books include The Maternal Imprint, The Contested Science of Maternal Fetal Effects, and Sex Itself, The Search for Male and Female in the Human Genome. Um, uh, in 2018, uh, Sarah founded the Gen Harvard's Gender Sci Lab, a collaborative interdisciplinary research lab that generates concepts and methods for scientific research on sex and gender, which is related to the, the, the talk she'll be giving today, some of the work coming out of that lab. She's just an, it's an amazing enterprise. Um, and what I didn't know, which I would supply, is that in 2020, Wired, they, Wired magazine names are one of 32 innovators who are building a better future. Um, and um, I've, I've known Sarah now, uh, coming up on almost 20 years. Um, and you know our, our lives and works have sort of intersected around various issues around um, race and gender and science. Um, I've been a long time fan of her work and I'm just so pleased she can come here and, and speak with us and, and give you a perspective on some of these things um, you know, that uh, has implications for law and policy, but it's also from outside the world of, of the law school, which I hope provides with a really nice and sort of re refreshing and provocative perspective on some of these issues. 
So with that said, I will turn it over to Mr. Okay, I'm going to try to project. Can everybody hear me? I'm really happy to be here. As um, John said, and thank you, John. We have known each other a long time. I've known you since graduate. I was in there. Um, and I, I've learned so much from your church and engaging with it. Um, so as John said, I am a historian and philosopher of science, not a legal doctor. But my work just keeps bumping up again in <laughs> legal and policy questions. And um, I'm going to share you know, the garden path of my journey at encountering these questions and grappling with these questions. And I'm looking forward very much to the discussion. So I first want to situate myself and everything I'm going to say today in the context of this collaborative interdisciplinary research team, um, the Gender Time Lab, which I direct, um, that many of the ideas that I'm going to share with you emerge wholly from our collaborative discussions. And I'll name a couple of key people, but really it's such a collaborative process that our work uh, comes out of conversations that are between uh, scientists across fields like evolutionary biology, genomics, neuroscience, psychology, um, the social sciences, including the data intensive and more qualitative social sciences, and humanities scholars from uh, literature to philosophy um, to history. Um, of course, a lot of gender studies. Um, and we work to advance the intersectional study of gender and, bi and biomedical sciences. We work to counter bias and hype in these areas of science and to broadly enhance discourse surrounding these sciences. And I think the immediate approximate thing that led John to invite me is that all of this bumping up against policy and law finally led me to write something, which landed in Science Magazine. Um, and I'm quite proud of that initial um, product where we tried to offer some landscape analysis of the different approaches to constructing sex in law and policy, and also some recommendations, this being in science, um, to working researchers whose work uses sex-related variables for how to conduct ethical and responsible research in light of this broader context. Um, the, it's the right to say that contract success and in particular biological and medical contracts are prolifically sourced in law and policy with many differing definitions, and across many important areas of equity and civil rights, from employment discrimination to healthcare, identity documents, issues around immigration and asylum, prison housing, uh, things like restroom, educational and sports segregation, pregnancy and lactation policies, and even at the level of research institutes and federally funded research requirements for data gathering, data analysis, and data reporting. So let me just start with some assumptions or broader frameworks that led me to this question. Those of us in the science and technology studies fields who study the history of biology and medicine are often starting from a point where we think about the intersection of the biological and the social. And a common premise among people in my field is that biological categories overlap with and intersect with and are co-constructed in relation to social categories. So you have your Foucault standard approach to this and many, many other contributions to this literature that walks this path of examining the intersection between the social context and the needs of that context and the way in which biological sex is written on the body and the way in which biological concepts of sex then inform, reinforce forms of sex hierarchy 
in social oncologies. But this model is probably too simple that I've got up here. We need a much more sophisticated model of the intersection between biological sex concepts and what appears in law and policy. There's an important mediator. There are many contrib contributors to these constructs. And the important mediator we, we might call folk sex concepts. Right, so these are non expert discourses that culturally refine and entrench um, and cultivate and defend or critique uh, reigning categories and concepts. And these are dynamic, there's a churning around what sex is and how we should understand male and female, and there's prolific interaction, and you would even want many more arrows than that. But in other words, I'm presenting a sort of looping, dynamic relationship between social concepts of sex and various expert and administrative discourse. In the science piece, one of our contributions was this landscape work. We look at policy and we look at legal scholarship and policy scholarship, and we saw three main approaches to constructs of sex. So our first contribution was to characterize these and to name them. We found biological essentialist concepts of sex that is referenced to in the policy itself, sex as a binary that is given by biology. And I'll give more examples of this and discuss it quite a bit more in what's to come. We also identified two alternatives to this sex essential approach. We identified legal strategies that are very, very comfortable with uncertainty, ambiguity, and contradiction, and deploy differing concepts of sex where you need it to create the outcomes desired. Um, and so here, sex is just understood as a pragmatic legal construct. Uh, it doesn't refer out to biology. A good example of a pluralist approach is a, the move to allow third sex on identity documents, sometimes indicated by an X, right? So that retains sex in the document. It simply offers a third option. And we might imagine that's dynamic. In the future, there might be four options. It might not be X in the future. In some localities, it's I. There are different ways of creating equity in different locations and in different social and political contexts. And then there's the abolitionist approach. And the abolitionist says sex classification should be removed from law. And there, there is an unremitting harm for the law to be engaged in creating sex categories. And just in case your imagination can't quite get to what that might be, I give a couple of legal references, which I would diagnose as abolitionist arguments. Um, there's a recent piece um, by Clark and colleagues um, are in the New England Journal of Medicine that argued that birth certificates should not include sex diagnosed birth below the fold. Um, and that got a lot of discussion. Um, and uh, here's another example, this great work by Naomi Schoenbaum and uh, David Fontana around unsexing pregnancy. There's also work on lactation. Why do we need sex category in, it, it's investigating why we would even need sex category in laws designed to um, protect pregnant people. So those are just a couple of examples of application. I'll return to that. So that was just an overview of what we did in that. The talk today is going to go through four sections. In the first one, I'm going to define biological sex essentialism and also offer some critiques and an alternative, which is sex contextualism. That's been theory building work that I've been doing over the last few years, and I want to uh, describe that to you. But next, I'm going to dig in a little bit more to current examples of biological sex essentialism in law and public policy. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what I think 
and this could be really great room for discussion, um, should be advised to scientists on the one hand for responsible conduct of research on sex in light of this policy and social environment, and also advice to policymakers and legal professionals um, from what we've learned so far. So let's start with biological sex, essentially sex. What is meant by this term? Now, uh, biological sex, critiques of biological sex essentialism are not the same thing as the argument that sex is not real or sex should not be attended to. It can be conceded that there might be many good reasons to attend to sex-related or reproductive-related variables in biomedical research. And we historically, the arguments for attending to these variables have been around the importance of them in health and development, uh, the importance of generating biomedical findings that are generalizable to all bodies, right? So the inclusion paradigm. And um, within many areas of biology, sex-related processes are important to the developmental and evolutionary history of our species. But there are well-documented problems with biomedical research on sex. It is conducted by humans in a social world, and there are a lot of analyses that demonstrate crude comparisons that overstate the differences between the sexes and lack rigorous methods in study design. Quite a bit of my research has been around problems in the study of the genetic architecture of sex differences, for instance. Um, there's also a consistent failure to consider uh, as anything other than a typical um, the bodies and identities outside of the male-female sex binary, which could include uh, gender non-conforming people, including trans people, uh, non-binary people. It could include uh, intersex people, as well as people going through different life stages where uh, sexual and gender identity is fluid um, or changing. And then there is the way that we know the biological essentialist views can reinforce harmful binary and essentialist views of men and women in policy and in everyday discourse. That's a wide, well trammeled body of sociological, gender studies, and historical scholarship that shows how strongly pinned patriarchal gender ideologies are to biomedical notions of a fixed and binary difference. So, in my own work, um, I have done conceptual works to show how if you begin research from a binary sex essentialist paradigm, this will influence the questions asked, the material selected for the study, and the aggregation and interpretation of data. That is, our starting concepts drive how we even operationalize variables in science. So data and Biological materiality doesn't just speak for itself. It is being interpreted through a set of concepts that are interpolated with our cultural paradigms of gender themselves, right? So our starting concept of sex is already influencing what we derive as knowledge about sex as a biomedical variable. So if we conceptualize sex as maleness and femaleness, we'll operationalize sex, as many do, as comparing males and females. So what is biological sex essentialism in biomedical research? It refers, it, it, it contains the idea that sex refers to the binary of male to female. And that maleness, there's maleness and there's femaleness and their essences represented by the presence or absence of a discrete set of biochemical factors. And sex as a biological variable is considered sufficient we analyze when biomedological materials derived from both sexes are just included in research and compared. So um, this is the approach that our lab and my own work has spent a lot of time analyzing. What are the implications of approaching science and materiality and biology with this one picture of how sex works and what it ont ontologically is, right? 
right? And it's embedded in a number of federal policies for data reporting and gathering and um, aggregation and interpretation, including the uh, National Institutes for Health, uh, Sex as a Biological Variable Policy instituted in 2016. Um, and it has a very hard line requiring researchers, not only who are working with human bodies, that's actually been true since the early 1990s, but actually researchers working with cells, tissues, animal models, right, um, to, and cell lines to analyze for sex-related biological variables. So this policy only requires researchers to disaggregate and compare male and female materials, right? I just provide a quote from their uh, requirement for studies using both sexes, the requirements to develop a data analysis plan prospectively that at a minimum provides for the collection of data disaggregated by sex. Um, so since 2016, every scientist funded by the NIH has had to prepare a statement with their grant application describing how they will disaggregate their data in this particular way. So um, there isn't, however, there are alternatives to biological sex. <clears throat> and there are even alternatives to biological sex essentialism that attend to the materiality of sex, permit uh, all sorts of um, creative biomedical research to occur without assuming a biological sex binary. So if we instead conceptualize sex as variables produced, as variation produced by sex-related variables, we will then operationalize sex as material factors that vary among and within sex subclasses, however a researcher has to find them. And this is the view of sex contextualism that I have been fleshing out philosophically. Um, this will become important as we sort of get into the larger debate around biological sex essentialism. So sex contextualism says um, there is no world in which we can put a prior oncology of sex that says it's two sexes and they are male and female. It says that the definition of sex-related variables and whether they're relevant to biological research depends on the research context that there's no single component or set of components that specifies sex across biomedical research programs, and that any variation produced by sex-related factors should be interpreted within a well-specified research context. Note that male-female comparisons may not be necessary to do this. They also might not be sufficient. You might not be getting at the actual variable you want just doing that comparison. And research context, I define um, at multiple levels, but it basically involves the pragmatics of the research and the research material involved. Now, I'm clearly thinking in a laboratory research context, but stay with me. Um, so that is, for the sex contextualist, sex-related variables gain meaning and emerge as relevant or not within the context of a particular research program. It's a pragmatic pluralist approach to sex and biomedical research sensitive to social implications. Um, and it, it, it brings in an ameliorative approach to thinking about sex, I think, that requires the researcher to justify their choice, not root them in prior oncology or assumption that all there is is maleness. Okay. So, um, all right, now let me get to the policy part. <laughs> You're squirming in your chairs. Where's the policy part? Okay, so in, let's go get to how biological sex essentialism appears in policy. I've given some broad examples of this. The lab has engaged at four different levels on this question. I've mentioned the matter of state and federal data gathering and reporting policies. In this section, I'm going to talk about appeals to biology in anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ plus legislation and policy. Now, needless to say, uh, appeals to biological sex essentialism in anti-trans discourse and policy and legislation 
are ubiquitous, quite self-evident. What you're looking at here is a picture of the so-called free speech bus. This bus actually came to Boston a couple of years ago. It also drove all over Europe. Um, and it's an international campaign, anti-trans campaign. And you see the image of um, a little girl and a little boy with the XX and XY chromosome signifiers over their genital area. And it's really putting forward, you know, just the visual of biological sex essentially. Like it's at the core of the message, right? Um, so it's certainly there in the advocacy discourse. Um, as my colleague and the lead author on the science article, Mayan Sudai, who's a uh, professor of law and gender studies at University of Haifa, uh, also found in, in other of her work, definitions of biological sex appear all throughout the so-called bathroom bills in US state legislatures. Um, these are the bills that ban trans and non-binary or gender non-conforming people from using the bathroom that is their preference. And they use a strategy of appealing to genetics, anatomy, biological or medical sex. Um, so this language is also in the legislation itself. Some of this is appeal to specific, sex-specific findings, right? Specific claims of biology. And also some of it is general appeal to the authority of science, which is interesting from this craft, actually. So one of the events that our lab engaged with um, and that brought us closer in touch with policy question was the 2018 U.S. Health and Human Services memo, which um, defined, this was under the Trump administration, it defined um, sex in just this way, echoing similar rhetoric from lag advocacy campaigns and other laws that have been implemented or proposed um, that again uses this strategy around biological sex essentialism. In the memo, um, which was designed to exclude from health protections uh, transgender people uh, and also to exclude from protection people who need abortions and other things. Um, it defines sex as a person's status as male or female based on immutable biological traits identifiable by or before birth and argues that this definition is necessary to define sex on a biological basis that is clear, grounded in science, objective, and administrable. Uh, so this HHS rule really reflects a core strategy of anti-LGBTQ plus advocacy globally. We're seeing an appeal more and more to biology and science as a warrant to exclude gender minorities from services and to continue discriminatory policies. The HHS rule excluded specifically from the scope of the Affordable Care Act, anti-discrimination protections because of sex, covering statuses such as termination of pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Um, so you can see this sweeping strategy. Now, most of you will know that there was then, and this was sort of one of the responses that I had, this is phobia cloak in science, right? There's, there's also a selective appeal to science here so that they're appealing to some notion of anatomy or genetic without actually appealing to the many sciences mm -hmm. of sex and gender and sexuality. There are social sciences which of, of those fields, right? Which know that sex is a multidimensional trait and holds of biological and social components, right? And you don't have a science of sex complete without a science of gender identity as well. But that's, I'll stop that. <laughs> you all know the Supreme Court in 2019 in Boston um, held that discrimination on the basis of gay, lesbian, or transgender status is discrimination because of sex. And this voided the HHS policy. But, but the decision itself actually does not offer a statutory uh, definition of sex and legal experts, and here I'm using the analysis of other legal experts, not my husband, <laughs> um, believe that it will continue to therefore refer out to and implicitly or explicitly rely on and reinforce the binary essential construct of sex if we don't do a lot of work. 
you can have it not do that. So this view of sex leaves open whether it's a violation um, to discriminate in the context of bathroom dress codes in other areas, and there's going to be a lot of litigation around that. All right. Um, so that's one concrete area where this is very much alive. That. Oh, I think we've got one good. All right, uh, so in this section, I want to talk about advice to scientists on responsible conduct of, uh, of research on sex in light of the current policy environment. Um, many scientists will say, my science is distorted, my science is, is not an ought, it has no implications for all of this going out and going on in the world. I do consider part of the lights of well law and policy questions around uh, biology and sex to be uh, the guidelines for the ethical practice of science itself. And so I'm including this section in the talk. In this piece led by Mayan, um, we argued on multiple levels for the distinct importance around this issue of scientists being aware of the context in which their work will in inevitably be received. And precision is the first toehold into that. So we certainly argue that clarity, precision, rigor, context specificity is important to that, but there's more too. So let's back up. What are intuitions? What are com common? Uh, beliefs about what is responsible in ethical science. It requires opening data and methodology to rigorous critical examination, including multiple perspectives that may challenge one's own assumptions. Um, it requires reasonably anticipating and working to ameliorate potential harms of research and contextualizing research findings in a way that accurately characterizes the degree of scientific uncertainty in any finding. Just these things alone may not change the way others cherry pick scientific findings, but it would be a very big departure in practice from what we generally see in the reporting out of scientific results. So our recommendations for scientists who study sex differences, um, and we offer these humbly, some of us are scientists, some of us are other kinds of scholars who have thought deeply about science and scientific ethics. We really argue in this piece the importance of educating scientists on this landscape, how ideas about sex and biomedicine are used in the law. We believe scientists in this context can reasonably anticipate their research will be received in the current policy context. In addition, we have these points about uh, precision, with the use of sex as a concept, being clear about the limits of sex as a binary concept within work, contextualizing the use of sex-related variables and any kind of sex differences, and, and addressing misinterpretations. We also argue that sex is often included in analyses and in data sets that are reported out simply because the data has been tagged with sex. Um, and that many times it is not needed, nor is it part of a hypothesis-driven mechanistic case for why sex would be relevant to the question. So perhaps consistent with the abolitionist approach that I outlined before, we argue that scientists too should remove unnecessary use of sex categories in the design and conduct of an interpretation of their scientific studies. Don't throw it in just because it's there. Um, and then we also argue for the importance of countering biological sex essentialism, and this may include taking on board, board in the study, or at least in the discussion, the role uh, that social factors may also play in producing biological findings of sex-related variation. Okay. But on to advice to policymakers and legal professionals. This is where I'm so excited to have the opportunity to discuss with you because I'm very humbled 
by the idea of offering advice to, I, I, I'm very interested in the idea of dialogue with, right? Um, the chance to be in conversation with, with people who think like you do um, about the law. So we surveyed the literature and we invited uh, 15 legal experts to a meeting at Harvard, hosted by the Harvard Gender Sci Lab, mm -hmm. to find out uh, what the field thinks, where the field is, and um, we found some broad areas of consensus among gender and legal scholars on constructs of sex in the law. And I would describe them as follows. Whatever gender slash sex is, it is plural in the law, right? That you can't look at the legal landscape and say, yes, there is a definition and it's always this, <laughs> right? Um, there actually is no uniform definition or construct of sex or law, and sex or, or gender in law and policy. And I'll just add in foreign science. Um, there is also um, a consensus that there's some need to look at differences sometimes um, that may be sex or gender related in certain areas of the law. But we don't necessarily need to talk about them through sex or gender frameworks. So hence, perhaps the discussion of lactation and pregnancy could be useful here, uh, or we could talk about hormonal status or any, any like there's some openness to the idea that there could be sex related variables that are important to legal discussions, um, physiological processes or anatomical uh, functions and capabilities, right? That might be important for creating equitable law. And, there's also consensus, just following on this, that we use sex and gender much more than we need to in law and policy, and we could use it less. There's, there's quite a bit of excitement about that approach. Now, where is their debate? I saw the debate when we convened this group as being principally, therefore, around just how, and these, these of course, are feminist legal theorists, okay? Uh, there would be another view in the room. We have also brought in the perspective that animated and was um, vocalized by the HHS memo, for example. That's a very distinct legal strategy and it's rooted in biological sex essentialism and certain views about the family and so on. Um, but in addition to that view, um, there, there's sort of these, these views and, and they are the, the debate is around how sex neutral we want law and policy to be, and in what context we do need sex and gender, and what context we could maybe get rid of it. So again, we have this tension between the plur what I would call the pluralist approach, they do not. Um, you could say it's contextualist, but I don't want you to get too confused with my contextualist approach. Um, but there's some interesting mirroring there, right, with the conversation around how, how to operationalize sex by scientists, and then what's happening when law and policy people tackle that question. So the, the pluralist approach says we should minimize the use of sex classification in law and policy, but they continue to be necessary in some areas. When we do use them, we should take care to do it in particular context to specify what is at stake for different constituencies? What the goals are, in other words. And the abolitionist approach says we should work to eliminate sex classifications in law and policy or get as close as possible to that goal. And I'm still mulling um, the relationship between how we in the gender side lab think about sex related variables in biomedical research conducted in human world and in all of these social contexts. And this debate over here in the law, I'm very interested in what you think is the relationship between emergent constructs for sex in violence, if any, and how the law ought to proceed. So to summarize, we've gone through a definition of biological sex essentialism, I've demonstrated that there are alternatives to that. The only alternative to biological essential, sex essentialism is not the view that there is no such thing as sex, um, or the view that 
the there is no clarity in the biology of sex. There are actually substantive positions that we can take that take on board the materiality of sex and embrace in our, uh, the full diversity of approaches to sex related variables. Secondly, I've given some examples across a range of areas from federal research policy uh, to state level legislation around equity to healthcare context um, where biological sex essentialism is very, very live in law and policy. And then we've talked about how we should engage scientists around these questions from perhaps an advocacy, responsible conduct and research standpoint and what advice we should give to policymakers and legal professionals, where I'm really leaving it more open for a discussion. So once, once again, I really want to thank this, thank you for being here um, and being so attentive. And we thank the students in and my colleagues in the Gender Sci Lab, and in particular, our law and public policy team. When I formed the lab um, from the beginning, I knew that I wanted lawyers, I wanted law people, um, I wanted to have a stream that was tracking and engaging the ways in which biological sex essentialism and binary ideas about sex were circulating in the world, and in particular how biological research was being taken up um, in these contexts. And Mayan Sudai has led that team from the beginning, and we also have Ellen Zhao on that team, and they are doing a wonderful job. So uh, thank you very much, and let's open to discussion. Okay, so now, do you want to field questions from the third round of that? And they just jump in while people are digesting. Um, both their lunch and your talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I obviously, you know, this, this all uh, resonates. So, you know, obviously, wonderfully with, with some of the issues I've been dealing with over the years, race, essentialism, and binary. I mean, not quite binary, but for the essentialism of it. Um, and I'm not quite sure where, where to start because there's so, I mean, you know, maybe I would just start with. Something you were just talking at the end because I don't don't want to go through everything that that grabbed me about this. But you were talking towards the end about you know there are some key areas where interestingly you know there there might be uh, uh, you might want to be using um, uh, sex frameworks less right. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned uh, you know uh, one of the examples you, you gave was like around lactation and so forth. I'm just wondering if you could maybe you know expand on what, where you see some of those areas might be and how that might. How you see that maybe playing out? Um, different, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the two examples or three examples I gave were yeah. pregnancy and lactation yeah. and identity documents. Right. Um, and just, yeah, space interestingly, space. Yeah. after yeah. Jessica Clark's article in Nedgem, which got quite a bit of attention, um, uh, the actually the, the American Medical Association also came forward with a recommendation. To uh, the, the to not enroll medical doctors in this practice of marking administrative documents with sex assigned at birth, as if that is a, a medical judgment that should that should be carried by the individual throughout their life. Um, and so uh, that's one that actually has received broad uptake and is currently under discussion. Um, so birth certificates. And then with pregnancy and lactation, the controversial argument are, um, you know, as you know, should we keep this under sex discrimination law per se? Um, does there need to be, uh, because people can get pregnant who are not necessarily female um, or women um, by these, uh, sort of antiquarian definitions, um, shouldn't, wouldn't we better be better off specifying the biological condition that is being covered for these protections? I'm not sure if I put that quite right, um, but that these are states of being that require protection. Um, and it's not really, the key thing isn't that it's sex related. Now, you might be feeling a bit of a tension around that, 
but um, what really would be lost and what would be gained um, if we could move that out from under the umbrella of sex discrimination law and proliferate this idea of diverse bodily states of being that require different kinds of um, amenities. Yes. So thank you so much. This is great. I want to push back or just sort of ask your reaction about your last point in sort of the decoupling of sex and pregnancy in the post dogs. Mm -hmm. And so I have to say, you know, in dogs itself, I um very well, the juxtaposition of the very quick dismissal of the equal protection and cites an old case which I don't know whether you're familiar with or to deal with it, which also basically said, well, you know, pregnancy discrimination isn't just discrimination, and there's a way in which, right, that the, in that context, so we're going, we're going to touch. Right, the decoupling has served to um, dismiss the equal protection claim, but also dismiss, I think, the connections and the context in which um, denial of access to reproductive care is tied into a history, right, of misogyny and patriarchy. And it is social, at least socially connected. So denying, right? Well, pregnancy has nothing to do with sex. In the law, right, has a profoundly, um, again, sort of patriarchal. Thing. So I, I, when I, when I think about that, I, you know, I'm totally supportive of where you're going, sort of as an abstract. But when I think about how it plays out in the law. I wonder how sort of could you react to that? Because if we're just going to talk, because this is what the court did and the bills that put by the way, Congress passed the Pregnancy Discrimination Act specifically to override that. If, if we're going to just do pregnant people in the law, um, and there are so many reasons to do that, but there are ways in which we are pretending that it is not also right that the denial of these rights and, and health care is not also it's a very built in again connected to a history of patriarchy. So I just wanted to ask you I mean I'm gonna this is really annoying but I'm gonna be like I don't know. I I um I don't to be clear I am I I really want to thank you for for raising that and, and elaborating it that way, I think that's exactly the tension and that's exactly the set of debates. When and what context would we want to go more sex neutral? I'm um, being not a, as a not, not a policymaker nor a, a legal scholar. I'm observing these debates at somewhat of a remote, um, and I'm wondering then. My question is: So then, how does <clears throat> biomedical research enterprise interpolate with this. Remember the arrow is going both ways. So if the law declares that pregnancy is not under sex, what kinds of, what new terrain will it open up for conceptualizing sex for biomedicine, right? Um, but I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Those are, those are the tensions of this, um, the years of creating rights and protections around sex defined as male and female um, that cover also medical conditions such as pregnancy um, and the value of, of that um, versus these uh, abolitionist moves, um, which could be destructive. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know if it's about protecting rights, but it's recognizing categories of oppression, right? right? And it's similar right, to the debates you know, the Supreme Court's been on, say that we need to be race neutral and get rid of affirmative action. Like, 
So if there's a problem is, you know, you don't want to reapply the category and essentialize it. But if you now sort of rid yourself of the category, do you rid yourself of the power of confronting? Because the reality is the discrimination is not discrimination against lactating persons, although it may have that in any particular context. It's a much deeper, right? I mean, that's, that's pulling out a much longer, more complicated history and social structure of patriarchy and misogyny that affects people who are not, don't identify as women, but it's not, you know, it's not, you can't, if you, if you pull it apart, by particular biological moments, you're missing the big picture. Yeah, it could right. be. I mean, I will refer you to me. I, 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 no, I, 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 I think they work this, these arguments. I they work them to your satisfaction. Yeah, but, no, I'm just, yeah. I guess I'm just responding and sort of my sense. I have to say, my sense of this is different post dogs than it was reading that way. And these are pre dogs. That's what I'm just about to sort of wonder yeah. to get. Yeah. I phrase my question is how in the post dog. Yeah. I guess in terms of like uh, research, scientific research, what is the benefit of like going to a postmodernist view of sex to sex being how you feel versus like the physiological differences, like in terms of research? What do you mean by postmodern? Oh, what you were explaining there, and he populated male and female from the sex. Whatever definition you want to use, I guess I'm just trying to understand how, like, that's beneficial for scientific research. Like, what exactly are the pros of that versus the cons of that, and the pros of the other version versus the cons of that? Are you speaking of the sex contextual approach? I might have gotten the words wrong, but I okay. think so. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's a much richer, much more precise um, way of operationalizing that is making tangible and defining variables that we're using in scientific research. Um, you're able to access variation and heterogeneity as much as you are able to tap sources of difference, you can characterize um, uh, you can also slice and dice the data um, by different operationalizations of sex and therefore test your assumptions. Generalizability is enhanced because you're specifying the um, specific context in which you're doing the work, right? So we're talking about different organismic models, different laboratory conditions, different problem sets um, mm -hmm. that motivate the research, different technologies. Um, so I'm very rooted in the pragmatics of the artifactuality of lab-based biomedical research in developing that concept. Um, I think it much better describes, in fact, what scientists already do than the crude imposition of sex-based aggregation of research. And there's a whole body of literature, and we're now getting into this, the debate over the science, but um, that is analyzing um, the proliferation of sex difference claims that have emerged in light of the NIH policy and the weakness of those claims, the, the problems with replicability, um, the problems with the having um, sufficient numbers to make statistically significant claims. Um, and so I think that's actually the easiest case <laughs> to make. The harder case to make to scientists is and they're very squeamish about this, is also you should do this because of the world we live in. That, that they don't like. They don't want to hear from a historian and philosopher of science what they should do. Um, they're perfectly happy if you're giving them a better technique to access the variables that are inter they're interested in. Um, so I wonder how we can build a cultures of accountability and, and engagement um, among practicing scientists with how that work enters the world, because it's always contingent, underdetermined, uncertain work, making a very specific probe, a specific area that um, is then drawn into these in a much more amplified way, um, broader discourses 
that relate to people's human human rights. Um, I was wondering um, between the difference between the uh, the pluralist and uh, abolitionist views um, or approaches when we have the limited areas where we do refer to um, sex or gender in the law, I, I very clearly see that as, especially when we're confronting um, how historically and socially a, a group has been oppressed at, because of and using those categories. And so you'd have current laws that address that. I think this is kind of what I mean, Professor Parmet was saying, mm -hmm. or like adjacent to it, I guess. Um, but at what point do you see using those categories to address and like remedy or attempt to remedy that um, oppression as then just a continuation of those same um, right. categories? I mean, that's the tension. You okay. nicely described it. Um, and the professor used the term reify, right? And that, you know this dynamic in law. I mean, the, the bit of legal scholarship I read, especially critical legal theory, is very much about these questions. You create remedies, and oh no, <laughs> two decades later, you've got a problem on your hand where you've created an agential cut where maybe you shouldn't have. But still, it did a lot of good work. Um, so we are living in, as the social constructs and dynamics change, the law must be updated perhaps. Um, just how to do that, that encapsulates our best idea of justice and equity, I leave that to, to legal scholars. Um, but I think in part inspired by the, the way that conservative advocates are pushing at the concept of biological sex in the law, it's it, they, it, it's going to create a set of intense questions about where and when we want to retain that. Um, it isn't that biological sex wasn't there in previous eras, but it's, a, it's very interesting to see this particular movement moving to scientific warrant. You saw that quote from the Trump memo, and that comes from advocacy language. Objective and administratable scientific concept of sex. Um, this is basically from, if I may be frank, it's from a Catholic family organization and so on. Um, so it's really, it's a strategy. It's, um, it's, a, it's a familiar one, right? The reference to the authority of science. And so it's gonna really put pressure on these categories that were always understood by some to be legal constructs pragmatically constructed to create certain pr protections and now refracted against this biological view, potentially sources of dangerous essential. I really, um, I really like the idea of the really talk to scientists about their approach and how it can be used um, or how it is used and um, by like policymakers could then like you know push maybe the need for being pluralistic to that like more abolitionist side like over time. I think that's a cool approach. My friend does um, research in framing um, like sports performance as more of a hormonal level thing than by like sex or gender categories, um, which is fascinating. So I think everyone always thinks about like, what are the Olympics going to be like if we get rid of sex and stuff like that? Um, and just really looking at the, um, what you see, like the like bodily states or mm -hmm. those attributes and stuff. It's, yeah, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll take the gentleman right behind you and then we'll go back there and then. Um, yeah, I think that, that in some ways that hasn't created in like removing the safeguard that like the weaponization of like pearls used to like attack still attack like women's bodies or like pregnant people's bodies actually like presents an opportunity to address like um like dominance culture or like degrees of discrimination not based on these bright line rules. So I think that like 
the next step is like kind of like tackle discrimination <laughs> without like relying on like rhetoric as like our only defense. Can you can you say a little bit more about how that response that we've been discussing? I I I mean I think it law I think a lot about how like we have bright line rules about like who's who are protected classes and I think that like they're um inclusive of like certain classes of people who aren't necessarily getting protected or like they're in, intentionally limited in some ways so that there are it's always kind of like a a ruling class and a, like a subservient class and I think that like there's a huge hazard in like getting rid of like um like biological and essentialist like protections for women especially around like women's rights and stuff like that but in that absence I feel like there's opportunity for kind of like revelatory or like revolutionary like rethinkings of like dominance culture like thinking about we like we're given the task of like creating the tools to attack those systems rather than like relying on antiquated rhetorical arguments like protections that are like really confined to certain like what I think many of us would agree are like antiquated definitions of gender and sexuality. Yeah. Um and your comment may inspires me to just throw out another piece uh that I learned from legal scholars or policy scholars, um, which is to to pivot, you know, um a lot of this discourse is about ensuring protections for uh gender minority people um, in using a legal framework that was developed for a different set of protections. Um, and around the sports debate, for example, you know, um, it isn't just that these changes can better protect um, non-binary people or people outside of the binary rather. Um, all even cis people are subject to regimes of surveillance that are created by these biological essentialist constructs. So do we want, uh, even if you have cis little girl or cis little boy, their bodies being surveilled as they participate in sport at public school to see if they're masculine or feminine enough to not raise an eyebrow and violate the policy that's been created, right? So um, I'm seeing a lot of, arguments that make me see the the like you're saying the potential as we move out of these challenging debates for re-articulating what we mean by gender protections sure um i'm like still busy answering what person said that was great um but going back to what you're talking about with like um bostock leaving open the definition of sex I know you're not a lawyer, so if you want to punt, no problem. But like, from a pluralist perspective, what might it look like to have like a what would be a, like a pluralist definition of sex? Do you think? Or, like, what what are ways that people conceptualize that? Ah, um, well, in the science piece, we give you know, we we say um, you might want to say retain some sex protections for single sex all female education. And at the same time, you create protections, you create in other arena um, uh, protections against any sort of um, homosexual uh, protected environment. Or um, you, I gave the example of third gender classifications, which are uh, historically dynamic emergent signifiers that do break the binary and that vary in what they do um, and are that's plurals because you might have over in one area binary that say okay, you preserve your same sex for female education and you in another area you have three sexes or genders or four sexes or genders you know on identity doc documents um, and that's a pluralist world. You basically have multiple ontologies of sex embedded in the same legal system. And therefore adjudicators can't refer out to a single baseline of sex. There, there's this variegated terrain um, and they have to make up context specific rules to suit whatever scenario is in front of them. Um, 
maybe they can learn from <laughs> other policies, but I, I'm thinking on the spot here. But it, pluralist simply means there's a tolerance for multiple and conflicting constructs of sex in the law because there's a recognition of their, their pragmatic nature. We were going to go over here. Yeah. Um, and then. So I think this might kind of be getting at the same types of things we've been talking about, but um, I just like, I can help but think about like um, my own experience working in, um, in my undergrad, I worked in the lab studying Alzheimer's disease and like specifically on um, sex differences um, in the pathogenesis because it seems that um, a lot of people who have been identified as women tend to kind of um, deteriorate at a faster rate than people identified as men do with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I don't know, I think it's hard for me to kind of like hold both at once that we can know like, you know, um, there are intersex people, there are like phenotypically and genotypically, um, there are, you know, all these social factors at play and also like it can be, a, there can be utility in taking sexual characteristics in broad strokes to study areas that have been neglected like this. Um, and so I don't know, I guess I just, I'm struggling with that. And I, I wonder like what you would say to, to kind of determine like where and when those broad strokes can be useful. Um, and what models or organisms were you using? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a perfect example of sex consumption. <laughs> it seems like we're, we're actually taking Alzheimer's this year in the lab. Um, so many models of Alzheimer's are reverse sign in rodents, actually, and it depends on the um, actual uh, strain of mouse that you're using to model Alzheimer's, whether you get the same plaque formations and tau formations. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's point number one, sex contextualism is your answer to holding all of that in your head, that you're looking at sex related variables, right? You might be looking at estrogen exposure, right? Um, you might, might be looking at um, uh, a prior a parity, reproductive history, right? Um, and all of that, a model in a model organism that actually the male is a better model of the female <laughs> in humans. But let's go further than that. May, uh, women declining more rapidly from Alzheimer's may have to do with uh, biological factors, but there's very strong evidence for the role of social factors, right? They're diagnosed later. Um, they live longer. So rapid decline after diagnosis, you're actually older when you're diagnosed. Um, care systems are different. Um, things like sexual violence are a part of the history. Education, educational uh, attainment, which varies between men and women as part of the life history of Alzheimer's. Very strong associations. Um, so this is the perfect kind of rich, crunchy problem that a construct like sex contextualism is, is designed to help us break out of the binary approach. Um, what you would want to track if you're an interested scientist working from a neuro perspective on that is what are the specific variables and in what context do they make a difference? And then can we infer from those contexts and variables to another scenario like a messy human society? Um, and is, is the inference to a sex difference or is the inference to simply a difference maker in bodies? And then we wanna see how that works out. So that's a very enriched, <laughs> I may be overdoing it big answer, but, but the phrase you used is so nice. How can I hold that in my head, right? And you can, you can attend to sex-related variables without it being a binary. Um, so I think maybe one more question. I know that you won't be able to give me a, like a, a definitive answer in regards to this, but I know that currently the art work system is using a biologically centralist approach um, in regards to the binary. So how many years do you think from maybe like today um, <laughs> will it take for us to get to maybe a controlling approach or the current um, approach that's like outside of this um, biological approach? Oh, some people are already there. Um, and uh, you, in the community of biologists, I don't want to paint biology as being curious about this. There are lots and lots of biologists who are interested in um, approaches that are not sex essentialist and in these more contextualist approaches, for sure. 
um, in the law, I, I can't tell you, and I, I'm sorry if I pointed it, pointed to uh, abolitionism as being the goal, or it, I, I'm really seeing these as contestations within the legal community about um, strategy. So I, I don't see that as progressing toward inevitably, um, but there is going to be a grappling with these questions and it will inevitably refer out to expert discourses that include maybe very prominently include science and medicine. Um, so uh, inevitably so, what do we do <laughs> with that constant interaction between these discourses? We can't you know, shut the door tight on the laboratory and it's never gonna enter. <laughs> That's just not how it works, right? Um, so yes, both as the science changes um, and as the law changes, we can expect continued tensions around constructs such as male and female. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. What's the answer is really five years, three months, and seven days. <laughs> 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 Oh, thank you all for coming. And, um, and as Wendy mentioned at the beginning, uh, please keep your eye out for other other events and activities associated. And suggest them to us. And, and suggest them to us too as well. And, <laughs>